Thanks very much. This isn't a deep philosophical talk, but um, uh, I've worked in the UK for all of my academic career until January of this year. Um, I was at Leicester as Professor of e-learning and learning technologies, um, and previous to that at the Open University <coughs> Business School. And I've benefited by visiting professorships and opportunities to speak at, at most UK universities at one time or other in my career. Um, I was seduced to um, go and take a job as Executive Director of the Australian Digital Futures Institute, which is based at a place called uh, Toowoomba um, in Queensland, which is 100 miles west of Brisbane, right up high as the Australian range starts. So when, when the conference organisers wanted to invite me to speak, we discussed the variety of things that it could be. And uh, I could have talked to you about research or my new book or all sorts of other things. And now they, what they wanted was some sort of impression of Australia um, in my first eight months there. So this is what I'm going to do. But I'm going to show you some of my impressions so far of the similarities and differences because, as you know, in making comparisons, hopefully there's lessons for us all. Um, and I learnt something by reflecting on it, as you often do too. So I'm, I'm delighted to have the chance to share that with you. Um, so does everybody know what kookaburras are? You can see some nice ones up here. Yeah, uh, cricket balls as well. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> they, um, they're quite prevalent throughout eastern Australia. Um, and the most characteristic thing, really, is that they um, have this amazing cackling laugh. And there is a YouTube video with it on Donnell. So if we get time, <laughs> I'll, I'll put it up. Um, and it, when I first heard it, which was in our garden, um, it reminded me of being in a university, really, because there was people going around cackling about all sorts of things and continuing this over quite a long period of time. And I suddenly thought that they were pretty much like the kookaburras, really. And, um, but the kookaburras are also extremely interesting because when you look at the Aboriginal knowledge, kookaburras have been very much valued over the years. Um, mainly, I think, um, for their ability to get rid of snakes. Um, I have got a fantastic video, which is on YouTube, sewing a kookaburra catching, killing and eating the snake, but I just thought I wouldn't show it to you right now. Shall I? No. <laughs> um, but you can go and have a look. If you put kookaburra and snakes into YouTube, you do get some amazing pictures. And one of the reasons for that, I think, is that they are very easily... Um, enticed into gardens. Now, in Australia, they have, um, it is a requirement that all swimming pools are fenced, at least a metre high in particular kinds. And you'll see with some of the pictures I've got that this means that you've got just the right platform and they all sit along, here you can see them in a branch, but they all sit along the top of the fence on our swimming pool and almost everybody else's as well. Um, and they're actually from the kingfisher family. So they really, really uh, like a meat. They don't eat seeds. We also feed all the other birds and the uh, roos and all sorts of other things in our garden. Um, but we, we've attracted a whole variety of parrots and parakeets by seeds. Um, but the only thing we found that the kookaburras are eating is minced kangaroo meat raw. They don't like it cooked. Tried them with dog food and that, but they wouldn't eat it. Um, and they, um, they now come every morning and um, uh, sit around waiting to be fed. Um, and they, they just really are a metaphor for being in the university, I promise you. They're all lining up waiting for someone to sort the technology out for them. So it's okay. So to what I was going to talk about is a few personal snaps, but I thought I'd show you where I am. This is Australia, of course. Um, 
What these uh, green and red dots are is um, to say where Australia, and I'm going to say a bit more about this later, is just on the brink of Russian, uh, rolling out a complete national broadband network across the country. And um, the red were the pilot areas. This is up in the north of Queensland, and you can see some of the others. Um, and this is where we are here, and Toowoomba, where the USQ uh, campus is, or one of them, uh, is going to be in the second wave, and that starts now. So it's really interesting because we are being given the opportunity to truly test what it means to have effective high-speed broadband, either in a rural or a, a small city area. Um, and so that's fantastic in terms of tr uh, being the opportunity to try things. So that's where I am about there. Um, I arrived in January, um, my first weekend there. Um, it, it was sunny for a day or so. We'd left England in minus 13 degrees and huge snowfalls, which thawed just for a day or two immediately after Christmas and enabled us to leave. Um, and then very soon after our first weekend came, uh, it started raining, and it rained and rained. I'd, I'd never seen rain like it. Um, and as a result of that, on my first day at work, Toowoomba flooded. And this was an example of what it looked like. And it was like, they called it a tsunami, because what happened is that once these kind of cars and so on started floating away, they blocked all the bridges from the creeks, and it simply backed up and went into a brand new shopping centre. Um, where our car had been parked the day before, and uh, it's just a chance event. But 35 people lost their lives there, and the water then went down the range and met with a very high tide at Brisbane and flooded Brisbane. Um, so that was my first introduction to Australia. Um, and most extraordinarily, um, it also introduced us to how resilient and how collaborative and how community orientated the Australian people were. Um, we'd been pretty fed up, um, uh, only just getting away and only just having roads and pavements to get as far as Heathrow when we left the UK in the snow last winter, only to find that the community spirit and the huge resilience in the face of extraordinary and unexpected disasters um, was quite remarkable. I, I don't really know what that is about that, but I can promise you there was something very, very different about the Australian community's response to this particular disaster compared to the extreme conditions that we'd left behind in the UK. So probably the subject of uh, another conversation. Um, anyway, we got over that, and um, when my daughter came out at Easter, um, She's a, an amateur photographer, but this is genuine. Um, the, uh, you can see the people on the bridge there. You know you can climb Sydney Harbour Bridge. Um, well, Paula and I were standing actually in the Opera House going, looking back, and, and that was um, my husband up there, we think, as far as we can <laughs> tell. <laughs> and uh, we also, this was a harbour cruise on Good Friday, and uh, it was absolutely fantastic and so easy. So you can see why people love these places, because they're just such attractive places to visit. Um, this was in our front yard as I went out my, for my first professorial inaugural lecture. As you can see, it's quite a large carpet snake that was on the move across our driveway. They're, they're not dangerous, um, but for Danelle's benefit, it's um, very beautifully marked. Um, across its back and very attractive. Um, there are some dangerous snakes there and one of the first things my colleagues at the Futures Institute did was show me pictures of them so that I know not <laughs> what were dangerous and what weren't. The same with the spiders. Um, but that was certainly just outside our front door, that one. Um, we were celebrating my professorial lecture that day. Um, this is my daughter, Paula, and myself. Um, held in a koala. In, uh, in Queensland, you're allowed to hold them. Um, in Victoria, you're not. Um, and this is a, a, a place called Lone Pine near Brisbane. Definitely work, worth a visit if you're in Australia. We had an absolutely wonderful time there. 
Um, and so I thought you'd like to see. They're incredibly cute. They're so wonderful and gorgeous. Um, now, back to the kookaburras. Um, this is our backyard. The, this is um, the fence around our swimming pool. And this is one of the most gorgeous birds that, that visit us, as you can see. Um, you can see, as I say, they're part of the kingfisher family. And the ones in that area of eastern Australia have this incredibly blue, turquoise blue on their wings. This one is waiting to be fed, and there you go. That's my husband throwing a piece of mincemeat. He now holds his hand out and they take it from his fingers, but, and uh, there he is. And as you can see up here, we've also attracted a whole variety of other birds because the kookaburras quite often drop things. And this bird actually comes down and takes it between there and there before the kookaburra gets it in his mouth. They're kind of big magpie type things. And these pictures were taken by Ali, who was sitting at the front here when he visited us recently on his iPhone. And uh, we've got lots more besides. So anyway, so that's just to tell you about some of the environment that's in. When I had a look round to see whether um, there anybody had really thought about this interesting phenomenon of higher education between Australia and the UK. Um, I found there was quite a bit of comparative literature about, but it was mainly on kind of government policy type of stuff. I really didn't find much, certainly in the time I looked, that made a comparison between the UK and Europe and Australia, which I thought was quite surprising. I'm sure somebody will tell me otherwise now, but I certainly didn't find anything much that was of interest. And I think in view of some of our so similar roots, um, it's really quite an interesting study at the moment. Um, <clears throat> in fact, so what I'm, most of what I'm going to tell you is really um, experiential. I'm starting to get involved now in certainly Queensland policy and certain to try and innovate in the University of Southern Queensland. You know, I think if you look at Australia as a global player in higher education, there, are con there really are weaknesses and strengths compared to here. Um, and most of them are to do with Australia's geographical isolation rather than the social structures, I think. And also the fact that it's usually dominated by SMEs of various kinds which is more like sort of southern Europe in many ways. Most people are employed in very small companies, rural areas. Um, that seems to have resulted in a very low um, propensity to network and collaborate across institutions and between universities and organisations. Um, I'd say less than here. Um, so that was one interesting thing that I, I first came across. Um, there, there is the notion of collaborating to compete the same as there is here, but I think in practice there's rather less of that happening than you would think. Um, however, another contrast is Australia has one of the really incredibly strongest economies in the world at the moment. Um, and I know that some people made some friends I've been speaking to. They, they're completely amazed that we're not being subject to some of the same things that are happening here. Um, there's been really almost two decades of continuous growth without the dip that's happened almost everywhere else in the world. And um, there has been a huge amount of structural reform in government and states. And so you've actually got a remarkably flexible and resilient economy which also, of course, underpins your ability to operate in the global markets. And I, I, you know, I do think the strength of Australia's economy has been highlighted in recent years. Um, and they have managed to resist a number of internal and external events like major drought, housing boom, and the Asian financial economic crisis. So you would then think that there would be a huge amount of innovation because you kind of think that you'd innovate more in a situation of that kind of economic strength. Regrettably, I've been somewhat disappointed about that. Um, it, obviously, there is a strong 
record of innovation and achievement in many fields, including sciences, medicine, industry and agriculture, and of course mining. And a lot of the innovations and achievements are actually of a different sort of knowledge, or at least driven by this kind of the indigenous people and combined with the European settlers, um, have led to quite interesting um, combinations of old style and new style knowledge, which is very, very interesting to work with, and has led to quite contemporary medical and scientific breakthroughs. However, when you look at Australia rankings, say in OECD rankings, they're quite low on innovation still. So there are some interesting things around the area, which obviously spills off if you're trying to uh, innovate in a university. Um, I mean, one of these is the kind of obvious one, that the actual land mass is 33 times bigger. So I showed you just then where I was about here. Um, that's how the UK plus Ireland would fit in. Okay, it's another take on it. This is Australia. Um, how it would go afar over to Lithuania. So we are talking about a vast area, you know, and, and if you haven't been there, it's so difficult to quite imagine what that means and how it impacts on people's thinking and actual lifestyle. Um, now, Australia's population has grown from an estimated 350 thousand at the time of British settlement in 1788 and there's been numerous waves of immigration during the period since um, and at the moment due to these waves of immigration the European component of the population is declining as a percentage although that is of course happening here and in many other western countries. Um, in practice Australia has scarcely more than two persons per square kilometre of total land area because most of it is actually um, desert. Those are the states. Um, and 89% um, of Australia's population actually lives in an urban area. <laughs> and we think about the southeast of England starting to tip down. I can tell you, if you see uh, southeast of England, there'll be a lot more dropping in that way. Um, whereas the population itself is, is less than half of ours. Um, there's 40 universities compared to our 109. Um, so, I just want to talk a little bit about the impact of the National Broadband Network and accessibility. If you can see along here, this is the main railway line. Um, most of the, there just isn't railway or infrastructure in most of the rest. So it's very significant. <coughs> People drive, uh, the roads are, are highly drivable and empty. Um, and so putting this national broadband network in is going to be such a significant change over the next few years. Now, some similarities. There is dependency on overseas students, just the same as here. Um, and interestingly, as I was leaving Leicester, so they were just creeping into middle, the Middle East market, and University of Southern Queensland is also creeping the other way. So I'm starting the next time I go to Dubai or somewhere like that to meet students both from Leicester and USQ. Um, if the situation in Australia itself, um, I think, uh, from my observation, that there's quite a major rush um, towards... Um, the market competition and the push then to replace in many forms of academic governance, um, you know, it, and it, you know, it, they are all becoming much more entrepreneurial and corporate life, and that seems to be happening even faster than here, I'd say. So, um, there's deregulation again next year. It's not um, as strong as here, but it's still causing a little bit of shake up. Um, so essentially, we are moving from a republic of scholars to kind of stakeholder organisations. So, just a little bit about creativity and innovation. Of course, if you go to Australia, um, then you will find that it's incredibly creative and artistic. Um, this is the way I'm actually using um, 
the four approach to innovation that I used at Leicester, this time it's a space metaphor. Um, I haven't got time to show you this, but I hope you'll take a bit of a look. Um, those of you who are familiar with the four quadrants that we used at Leicester and is still in use there to innovate across the university. Um, then you'll see I've, uh, I've taken a similar approach and it seems to be working at USQ. So thanks very much for listening. I'm happy to answer questions and, uh, uh, and I hope you'll practice the kookaburra laugh for when you return to your uh, offices from tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jimmy. Thank you for coming all this way. It's a lot further than it, it used to be. Are there any questions that um, you have for Ginny that you'd like to ask? Um, they're still thinking. Anything online, Matt? Uh, not yet, but it's too tight. Okay. Uh, that's, always, okay. that's always a good sign. Okay. Have you got your video? Or is it not Sarah? loaded up? Oh, I'm sorry. There's a question uh, here. Can you just tell, tell us who you are and where you're from for the... Sure. Nigel Ecclesfield from the Learning and Skills Improvement Service. Just a quick one, Ginny, really to ask you to reflect on the possibilities for collaboration between Australian and UK institutions. I mean, there's, there's a lot of light, sort of heat generated by this, but not much light so far in mm. terms of, of gaining from our shared perspectives, which you, you indicated yeah. in the talk. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, that was one of my um, the ideas, really. That if we, th I think, in any partnership, you do need to work out what your strengths and weaknesses and what each of you bring to the table. And that's why I was quite surprised to find that there really wasn't much about about this. And that's why, obviously, I'm in a great position to start to explore that. So I think we do need to understand better what each brings to the table rather than just assuming we're both working in the same kind of environment. Um, I also haven't found much funding that supports this idea so I think it's up to us as individuals to get this ball rolling. Yeah. On from our virtual delegates. Uh, this question comes from... Oh, let me try that again. <laughs> this, <laughs> this question's coming from... Uh, Manish Malik um, in Portsmouth um, and he's asking about the Australia students rating of teachers and uh, is that something that might would be in innovative for the UK? Uh, yes, um, uh, I think that because of the slightly stronger orientation towards managerialism um, that there is in Australia it's probably more acceptable than it would be here would be my guess. Maybe that that would be something we could uh, have a go at, Nigel. <laughs> okay. Well, oh, there's just one up there. So. There's one up there. Rich. Rich at the Rich Ranker from Lancaster. I've forgotten the question in, in this transit up here. No, I'm teasing. Um, how many universities are there? And you said that there's very little collaboration. And I wondered, is there kind of an equivalent of, of alt in Australia? Um, uh, there might be some Australians who can answer this better than I can, but there's Ascolite. Um, which is probably the equivalent of membership organisations similarly. There's also a code, um, and there's been a number of there's a number of smaller organisations. Um, it, I, I mean, I'm only just starting to get involved with these organisations, so there's probably people who can answer better on this. However, it doesn't. They don't seem to have the policy impact um, that Alt has started to have in the UK. Um, but they are certainly communities of practice. So the idea of communities of practice is very strong in Australia. So I'd say, you know, between individuals working together, there's no problem. But I was thinking more on large-scale collaborations, not a lot of evidence of that, either within Australia or with overseas organisations. Did you know a bit more about that? Yes, yeah, somebody there. 
Uh, Matt Rill from La Trobe University in Melbourne. Um, yes, Ascolite members enjoy reciprocal um, arrangements with ALT members. Yes, that's and right. And I'm here as an And Ascolite they're just about member. to start doing CMALT as well. Yeah, yeah, so anybody who's an ALT member who'd like to come to the conference, um, you can get the member rates and that sort of thing. And, and yeah. there's actually quite a number of people who, who do, like yeah, myself, who, who are aware of ALT yeah. in Australia and yeah. vice versa. But I'd agree and with And I'm keynoting at the Ascolite conference in December. <laughs> but, uh, and, and also, however, I would say that the University of Southern Queensland, where I'm working, is the first overseas member of ALT. So it has to work both ways, doesn't it? Maybe some sort of live link up for yeah. next year's ALT C. Yeah, would be so quite that'd fun. be good. Yeah, it would be, wouldn't it? Satellite. Yeah, it's image. a good idea. Yeah, good. There's so much to learn from each other. There's one in the middle, if we've got any more time. Yes, we've got time. Thank you, Julie. The photos look so absolutely wonderful. <laughs> I can kind of understand why I might want to go to Australia, <laughs> but I wondered if you could expand a bit more as to why you went to Australia oh, wow. and what, what your strategy is, what, what learning purposes have you got okay. there? Okay. Um, I think it was just a bit of an adventure, and as you can see, we're, we're having that. Um, but also because um, the university offered me a serious approach, well-funded approach, um, to imagine in the future, and it was just irresistible. Yeah. <laughs> okay, can I ask yeah. you to join me in thanking Jilly very much for coming all this way? <laughs> and for both our speakers this morning, thank you both very much.